This is the last of the connective tissue points I'm going to make. Uh, the notion of a tissue membrane. Uh, you'll remember back to the connective tissue uh, slide outline that I, I had, there were um, four types of con connective tissue membranes. So, and, and this is really all you need to remember here is, is this little symbol I have, ET over CT. All right. Uh, a tissue membrane is simply a layer of epithelium on top of a layer of connective tissue. Uh, that's, that's the structure of one of these tissue membranes. There's four types, mucous membrane, serous, synovial, and cutaneous. We're going to go through the first three very quickly. Uh, I'm going to flash through them, and then we'll spend the rest of the lecture talking about the cutaneous membrane or the skin today. All right. First, mucous membranes. Uh, mucous membranes are going to line passageways that are open to the external world. This world that we live in is actually a pretty dry, harsh place. Um, and mucous membranes, that the, uh, so any epithelium must be moist for the chemical processes that happen at that surface at that apical uh, membrane surface uh, to happen. So uh, mucous membranes, these uh, epithelial layers that are exposed to the outside world, uh, must lubricate themselves, must uh, remain moist. We find these in the digestive system and uh, throughout the entire gut tube in your respiratory uh, tract uh, through the trachea, bronchioles, uh, the urinary tract, and the reproductive tract. So these are all of the epithelial surfaces that if you were super tiny, shrunk yourself down, you could walk along the surface of your skin into uh, one of these passageways. Um, so the uh, purpose of a mucus uh, membrane is to secrete mucus, uh, which is a... Uh, aqueous solution uh, enriched in mucins that are uh, polysaccharides that are that resist dehydration. This mucus lays on the apical surface of this uh, epithelium, uh, keeping it moist, uh, allowing it to uh, absorb whatever, like, so for example, in the nose, the nasal passages, if there's an odorant that you are trying to sell, uh, smell, uh, that odorant is easily uh, dissolved into the uh, mucosal uh, secretions uh, for triggering on the uh, sensory receptors there, or uh, if there's some sort of excretory process that's happening. Um, this is what's called a goblet cell. So if you were to look at the histology of any uh, mucosal membrane, uh, you're going to see these specialized cells that are called goblet cells because they look like goblets, and they are responsible for producing this mucus that's going to come out onto the, uh, onto the surface. We'll talk about muc mucosal membranes um, a little bit more when we get into the digestive uh, tract in the mucociliary escalator, uh, so charmingly named. Um, below the layer of epithelium is the lamina propria in any mucosal membrane, lamina propria. And this is a generalized term. It doesn't just apply here. Uh, lamina propria, it's this areolar tissue. It's the connective tissue layer that is uh, laying beneath this uh, epithelium in a mucosal membrane. All right, the second type of tissue membrane uh, are serous membranes. There are three types of serous membranes. We'll talk about those in a moment. Um, these are going to line various cavities which are not open to the external environment, yet still need to uh, have a moist surface to reduce friction or for various secretions. Um, they're thin, strong, and produce this fluid transudate. 
this fluid transudate, uh, its primary job is, is to reduce friction. Okay, so yeah, if its job is to reduce friction, what might you intuit about uh, what might you intuit about the function uh, or the, the locations in which you would find uh, one of these serous membranes? Friction occurs, but yeah. Oh, where things are moving. Where things are moving, right. So these are going to surround structures in the body which move. So what's an example? Just give me a guess. You don't have to be super clever here. You could just look at the picture on the slide. Uh, obviously, the heart is going to have one of these serous membranes around them. What are some other things? Yeah, look. Uh, lungs. Maybe. Lungs, absolutely. The lungs. We're constantly breathing. Lungs are expanding and contracting. Stomach. And the stomach. That's the third. All right. So the the entire uh, intestinal or, or abdominal contents are going to be surrounded in one of these serous membranes because food is moving through there, uh, and nobody wants a high friction burrito passing through their gut. So these serous membranes have two uh, portions. There is going to be the parietal and the visceral. Uh, what, does, what do those words mean, parietal and visceral? Do I have the word visceral on there? Yes, parietal and visceral. What, is, what are the viscera? What is a viscera? What is a visceral reaction? When you have a visceral reaction, like you watch, I watch Sean Spicer on the news, and I get a, have a visceral reaction. <laughs> what is that? That's my... Patriotism, I believe it's called. Oh, my what? I believe it's called patriotism. patriotism. Yeah, patriotism certainly is a visceral reaction. It is your organs, your organs, your viscera, right? So uh, the visceral portion of a serous membrane is the portion of the membrane uh, that lays right on the organ, right on top of the <laughs> organ. And then... Um, it is juxtaposed with the parietal portion. So um, when I was in graduate school uh, at Notre Dame, this was Catholic school. And um, here you guys have co-ed dorms. Is that right? There are co-ed dorms here? That's amazing. Um, in Notre Dame, they did not have co-ed dorms. And uh, they had these things called parietals. So um, at, I don't know what time it was, 10 o'clock or something, uh, this was the parietal. After 10 o'clock, all the boys would come scurrying out of the girls' dorms, and all the girls would come scurrying out of the boys' dorms, uh, heading back to their, their home base, right? Parietal means wall. It means wall. Uh, and in that instance, it was the wall past which you were not allowed to. Uh, cross. You had to get out. That was the wall in time. But here it means the wall of the cavity. So there's the visceral portion and then the parietal portion, which is on the wall uh, surrounding that organ. Okay, and we'll see uh, here how we have uh, the heart with its, uh, its um, the pericardium, the visceral pericardium. The serous membrane for the heart is called pericardium. Uh, the visceral pericardium is on the viscera, on the actual organ. And then the wall uh, of the mediastinum the, in which the heart finds itself is lined with this parietal pericardium, the parietal pericardium. The space in between is the pericardial cavity. There's going to be a serous transudate in there so that when the heart is doing its pumping action, it's able to do that with very low friction uh, within the cavity uh, in which it finds itself. Okay. And this serous membrane itself is really like a uh, poorly inflated balloon, uh, which is what this is trying to indicate. It's just a sac, and as, and as if the organ pushes itself into that sac, there's the, if you had a, a, a flattened beach ball or something like that, there'd be the, and you put your hand into it, there'd be the portion of the beach ball that was touching your hand, and then there'd be the portion of the beach ball that's not, that's on the, that's on the outside, okay? And that would be the visceral and, and, and parietal pericardium. There, there's three serous membranes. We just talked about 
uh, the pericardium. So these are serous membranes. There's three of them. All three types have a parietal and a visceral portion. You got that? And then the three types are pericardium for the heart, pleura for the lungs, and we see here the pleura around the lungs. A anybody like, um, who's that guy? Charles Dickens. Anyone read any of those Dickensian novels? You, you read in these about these, these old women from uh, Victorian era England who have pleurisy and they need to go to the coast uh, to, to relieve themselves of their pleurisy. Pleurisy is just an inflammation of the pleura uh, around, surrounding their lungs. It's quite uh, uncomfortable, apparently. The third type is peritoneum, the peritoneum. And this is an extremely complicated sheet of serous membrane, a contiguous sheet of serous membrane that surrounds all of the abdominal contents, except, notably, the kidneys. The kidneys are what are, are called retroperitoneal. They are behind the peritoneum and pinned to the back wall of the abdomen. Uh, otherwise, all of the intestinal organs are surrounded by visceral peritoneum, and then the wall of the abdominal uh, cavity is coated in parietal peritoneum. So uh, the abdominal peritoneum is important, uh, notable for people who are in kidney failure, uh, and they, you know, so what happens when you have kidney dysfunction? What, has anyone ever had a grandpa or grandma that's had kidney problems? What do they do for people who are, have, have renal insufficiency? Yeah, and so stick a needle in their arm, pump all their blood out through this machine, filter out as much as you can, and then pump it back in to them, right? And that's not very pleasant for those people. Um, there are instances, in emergency instances, uh, in which you can do something called a, a peritoneal lavage, where they will puncture the abdominal wall, not the intestinal contents, just the abdominal wall, into the abdominal space, and uh, engorge the abdominal contents, not within the lumen of the intestines, just in the space in the abdominal cavity where all those uh, organs reside. They will full, fill it with a hypotonic solution and then uh, waste materials uh, are able to diffuse across this visceral peritoneum into that uh, into that hypotonic solution. It's called peritoneal lavage or, or wash. And then they suck it out uh, of, the, of the abdomen. So that's another uh, much more radical way of, of dealing with uh, kidney dysfunction. Um, anything else here? No, I don't think so. Uh, it's taken longer than I wanted here. but um, Synovial membranes. So this is the third type. Uh, of tissue membrane. These line uh, joint cavities. So uh, here is a, a joint cavity. It is incomplete. There's not a, a, com a fully contiguous layer of epithelium in these. Um, this is going to, the, the primary uh, function of these synovial membranes is to make synovial fluid. This is the lubricant that enables your joints to glide over one another uh, smoothly. I'm not going to say much else about it, actually, but except to say that uh, it is the synovial fluid, which uh, often contains also the, um, the, it's the supporting fluid, the nutrient supporting fluid for uh, the cartilaginous end plates, the articular cartilage in, in a joint. So I talked about how cartilage is not vascularized and needs to get its, uh, it needs to get its nutrients by diffusion. Um, and so synovial fluid is, is part of that process of uh, maintaining healthy uh, cartilage. All right. And then the fourth type of tissue membrane is, is the cutaneous membrane, skin. Um, it's thick, waterproof, and dry. 
and we're about to talk about the skin. So, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to talk about the hair or the nails uh, at all. These are the extra accessory structures of the skin. Uh, I hopefully will get to talk about skin cancer a little bit and the five types of the cutaneous glands. I will talk about uh, the epidermis, the layers of the epidermis, and then just briefly touch up on the dermis and the hypodermis. So, um, it's 15% of your body weight, 15% of your body weight. So, uh, me, I am 150 pounds, so that means, what is that, 21, 22 pounds of skin on my carcass here. Um, it's about two square meters in area and only two millimeters thick two millimeters thick. It has uh, two components, uh, the epidermis and the dermis, uh, which are part of the cutaneous membrane. And then there are these accessory structures that we can talk about. Yep. Oh, I want to put this in. So I know your skin is your heaviest organ, right? Uh, but is it your heaviest organ system? Like, do all your bones added together weigh more or less than your skin? I'm not sure, but I'm going to keep forging ahead. I'm going to, we can talk about that after. Um, so, uh, thick skin and thin skin. There are actually two types of, of skin in the body. Uh, there's thin skin. This is skin that has four layers of keratinocytes in the epidermis. Uh, and we'll go through those. Uh, it also has hair in it. So the vast majority of your body is this thin skin. Even the skin on your back that may seem so thick, and indeed it is thicker than the skin uh, found maybe on your cheek or something like that. Um, it is still this thin skin because of the number of layers, the identity of the layers. And then there's thick skin. Uh, there's only a few places on the body um, that is coated in this. This is the hand, the, the surface of the hands, uh, the feet, your lips, um, the uh, portions of your genitals. Um, okay, so, oh yeah, that's the, so skin on your back is indeed thin skin uh, simply because it has hair in it and it has the four layers. So what does the skin do? Um, <clears throat> a lot. It protects you from uh, hot and cold. It protects you from UV radiation. It acts as uh, a water barrier uh, to both prevent dehydration and, uh, uh, the, and the penetration of aqueous uh, toxins or pathogens. Uh, it's a mechanical and chemical protectant. Uh, yeah, it protects against pathogens. As I said, thermoregulation is giving us sensory information. We've talked about how uh, it is the source of D3 in the body. And then, of course, it gives us uh, the, the, uh, the advantage of being able to express facial expressions and emotions. <clears throat> Um, so, the epidermis itself is also avascular. The dermis is richly supplied with capillaries uh, and blood, but it is an avascular stratified squamous epithelium. So, it's these squashed down cells, stratified, many layers of them. Uh, the nutrients and oxygen that these cells in the epidermis get, they get by diffusion up from the capillary, uh, the capillary beds in the dermis. They used to, not even that long ago, believe that the epidermis got its oxygen from the outside world. Um, and so I don't know if you're familiar with this here, but um, I remember being a kid and seeing this movie, Goldfinger, the James Bond movie, and this poor uh, woman here has been murdered by having her whole body painted in gold paint because they believed that she suffocated to death 
by having her. That was the premise in the movie, uh, based upon some dubious scientific um, uh, conjecture at the time. And in fact, even in this uh, this scene here, uh, apparently. There is a patch of skin on this woman's rump underneath her bikini where it was not painted because they were actually worried that it was true. They thought it was true. They thought that if they painted her entirely in gold that the woman would, would suffocate. That is absolute uh, nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. So, yeah. What about as far as like, your body eliminating heat and overheating? Would that be a problem? So not being able to sweat... Um, yeah, that would be a problem. You would have to generate a lot of heat, though. You'd have to run. And if I get time, which I, I may not because I've got a slow start today, but uh, I'll talk about a skin camp uh, run by the American Academy of Dermatology that I worked at where there were, um, there were kids with uh, dyshydroic uh, ichthyosis, where these were uh, people who were not able to sweat, and you did have to be, these people had to be very, very careful. Sometimes they could overheat very badly. Um, so that, that is sort of a concern. She doesn't look like she's breaking a sweat there, but um, okay. So <clears throat> the epidermis, it has, so th this is a depiction of uh, thick skin, because I have the five layers. There's a stratum basale, also known as stratum germinativum. This is where uh, the sort of um, the stem cells for the epithelial stem cells live. This is the, the um, germinative layer. This is where we have cell division. Uh, then on top of it is the stratum spinosum, so-called because these, these keratinocytes um, that uh, make up the cell type. These keratinocytes begin to dehydrate partially and look sort of spiny. Uh, then stratum granulosum, they, uh, by the time they get up here, they're, they're pretty well dehydrated, filled with these uh, granules that uh, have all this wax in them that are going to provide the uh, membrane barrier, the tissue uh, membrane barrier at the surface. Uh, stratum lucidum, only in thick skin, there's another sort of lucid layer uh, there. And then uh, finally a stratum corneum. This is cells that have, that are totally dead and have been compacted and uh, ruptured and released there. Uh, the contents of um, the various granules in the stratum granulosum. Um, Yeah, what else do I need to make there? No, nothing. So it take this whole journey from the stratum basale, or I learned it as stratum germinativum, uh, from the stratum germinativum up to the stratum corneum uh, takes about a month. Um, I've had dermatologists take, tell me 28 days. Uh, the, your textbook says 30 to 40 days. Uh, so they start down here. And as the stem cells, uh, mitosis uh, pushes the, uh, the keratinocytes upwards. Uh, this my mitosis requires access to blood. All right, so there's this um, papillary layer of the dermis, which is directly adjacent to this. This upper layer of the dermis down here uh, is richly invested with uh, capillaries that are serving the, uh, the mitotic keratinocytes in the stratum germinativum. Then they move up into the stratum uh, spinosum. This is where we have the cytoskeletal elements uh, are proliferating and, it, and making these granules. They're producing granules that are going to be filled with uh, a waxy lipid that will help to coat the surface of the skin. Uh, when we get up to the stratum um, granulosum and the stratum corneum. So then uh, stratum granulosum, um, this is where the cells essentially die at, at this point because they are, uh, have 
they are so far away from the nutrient and oxygen source that they need, um, they begin to release this protein filigrin uh, that is going to cross-link the keratin fibers that the keratinocytes are producing. So it's making this, uh, this meshwork of cellular products um, that are going to help make this a strong, impermeable barrier. Um, the epidermal water barrier. Uh, and then, oh yes, and so importantly, the cells begin to form tight junctions. So the keratinocytes uh, um, have these tight junctions that then uh, spread throughout the entire layer of the stratum granulosum. By the time they get to the stratum corneum, these cells are totally desiccated, compacted, and fairly ruptured uh, and begin to flake off as dead skin flakes. The dermis, uh, this is the layer beneath the epidermis. It, ha it has um, two layers to it. There's this papillary layer. So papilla, this word P-A-P-I-L-L-A, -L -L papilla uh, just is Latin for little hill, little hill, okay? And so the papillary layer is papilla. Uh, it, it's this layer of little hills, little papilla. Uh, so the, this is the papillary layer of the dermis, and then this is the reticular layer of the der dermis. Papillary layer is areolar tissue. Reticular layer um, is dense, irregular connective tissue. Um, both are full of... Uh, uh, capillaries, which are going to serve uh, the epidermis. Uh, this is where we have uh, all of these different uh, accessory structures resident, so hair follicles, uh, sebaceous glands. Uh, here's a bacinian corpuscle. Here's a Meissner's corpuscle or tactile corpuscle. Um, yeah. Is there any other point that I want to make there? Yeah, areolar and reticular and dense, irregular connective tissues. I think I said that. Then finally, uh, hypodermis. So this is the most common place. This is the, the fatty tissue uh, with the arterioles and venules that lays beneath the dermis. This is uh, the most common uh, place for, uh, for injection, uh, intradermal injection. Um, in the hypodermis, the, a hypodermic needle uh, gets uh, injected into the into the into the hypodermis. This uh, richly uh, this fatty tissue is richly invested with blood vessels. So this is that fat uh, acts as an energy reservoir. Of course, it's going to help uh, as a, a thermal insulation. Um, uh, and then it is this hypodermis, this subcutaneous fat layer is approximately 8% thicker uh, in women, helping women to survive famine better than men. Women are more important to survival of the species. Yeah? So that's the body layer at the bottom of the Yeah. The yep. The mm -hmm. Yep, this is the hypodermis down here. Yeah, Jacob. So if that's why it would be advantageous for women to have it, why is it advantageous for men not to have it? I would like to answer that, but I really want to get to the end of my lecture here. Um, essentially, it's all about resource management. And if you think about available calories as a resource and how that's being distributed, does that make sense? No. Yeah. Um, okay, skin color. Um, so skin color is uh, due to uh, the action of melanocytes. And I've already talked about melanocytes a little bit, haven't I? Uh, when I said that they produce this chromophore melanin, which absorbs UV radiation um, and uh, protects the delicate structures beneath it. Uh, <clears throat> these melanocytes... 
live in the stratum germinativum at uh, the bottom of the epidermis, and they send out uh, these pseudopodia that uh, are able to pass between the tight junctions between these epithelial cells, and they, uh, and they have little balloons of uh, membrane-delimited vesicles full of melanin that are able to then penetrate into the cells that they're adjacent to and fill those cells up with melanin. You can begin to appreciate why melanoma may be such a, a, a disastrous form of cancer because these cells are already pretty aggressive. They, they have uh, several of the tools for uh, a potent metastatic cancer in place already. Um, okay, oops. However, uh, it is not the case that people with dark skin have more melanocytes than people with lighter skin. That is not the case. It is, it is the case that people with darker skin, those melanocytes produce more melanin. That is the case. Okay? Um, so... And the melanin that they are producing, it breaks down more slowly. Uh, in light-skinned people, very little of uh, the melanin is seen beyond the stratum basale, whereas in uh, dark-skinned people, uh, it, it penetrates more fully into the stratum spinosum of that epidermis. Um, and that the melanin produced in light skin uh, people breaks down much more rapidly. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this, actually. This is not that important. These are just different reasons your skin can look different colors. Um, five types of cutaneous glands. So uh, three of them are shown here. There's two types of sweat glands, uh, also known as pseudor, pseudoriferous, pseudoriferous gran, glands, glands, glands. <laughs> the first type is the maritrine gland. These are very numerous. They're simple tubular glands. This is giving you watery perspiration that's helping to cool the body. You are hot. It is these merocrine glands, uh, also known as eccrine glands, uh, that are under, control, under the control of the autonomic nervous system, uh, which helps to cool the body, all right? Producing lots of relatively innocuous, uh, watery sweat. On the other hand, there's the apocrine glands. Uh, these are also sweat glands that are found in the groin, uh, the axilla, the anal region, uh, around the areola and the breasts and in the beard. Um, the sweat that these apocrine glands produce is thicker, milkier, uh, has a range of fatty acids in them, and uh, these apocrine, apocrine glands do not get produced until uh, puberty. Okay, So they get turned on by stress or uh, sexual arousal. One of the contents in the sweat uh, produced by these apocrine glands are pheromones. Um, pheromones are essentially uh, chemical signal. I'm, I'm sure many of you have already heard of pheromones. Certainly uh, all of you have probably experienced the effect of pheromones at this point in your life. Uh, they are uh, they're influencing the physiological behavior of uh, other members of the species, right? So this is how we send chemical uh, signals uh, between one another. Um, then the third type of cutaneous gland uh, of the five is the sebaceous gland. And here's an example of a sebaceous gland. Oops, no. Yeah, these numbers are not... Uh, Corresponding, but this would be a sebaceous gland. You know, that's a that's well, a sweat hair. Right. Oh yeah, thank you. Right. All right, this this 
I don't know where it's actually the they're referring ones? to. No, it's not this. I mean, it must be this. It's this. It's this in this diagram. Um, yeah, it produces sebum. So sebum is skin oil. Um, this is a holocrine gland. Uh, we talked about holocrine glands before. Uh, this is it's a uh, secretion from a cell that breaks down. Uh, this is going to keep your hair supple. It's going to uh, hair and skin supple. It's going to add to uh, the impermeable water impermeable barrier that's being produced by the stratum granulosum and uh, corneum <coughs> in the epidermis. Sebaceous glands. Um, all right. So sweat. Uh, what are the points that I want to make here? Well, there's uh, sensible and insensible per, uh, perspiration. Uh, for, you know, this insensible per perspiration is about 500 milliliters a day. This is perspiration that you are not aware of. Uh, you don't think to yourself, oh, I'm sweaty. Um, it's about yeah, half a liter. There's no visible wetness of the skin. Sensible perspiration is you go out, you start running, you are wet, and you are aware of it. Okay. Um, and also called diaphoresis, wet skin sweating. Uh, exercise, you can lose up to one liter per hour. Um, so... All right, two more glands, and then we'll be done. The ceruminous gland, this is basically earwax, um, produces semen, uh, sebum, pardon me, sebum and dead epithelial cells uh, to form this cerumen, uh, cerumen, which is earwax. Uh, this is going to help you keep the eardrum itself pliable. Uh, protects the uh, ear canal from various bacteria and other foreign bodies. Um, people like to clean out their ears with Q-tips. Uh, however, um, if, if you have a problem with earwax, the best way of dealing with it is just putting a little bit of mineral oil in there uh, because the motion of your jaw, the way the anatomy works here is that motion of the TMJ joint, uh, temporomandibular joint, uh, moves whatever's in this canal forward. And the reason that earwax gets uh, impacted or compacted in there is because it's too dried out for whatever reason. And if you add a little bit of oil, it will naturally come out and without having to disrupt uh, the, the flora of the uh, external auditory meatus. Um, all right, and then the last is the mammary gland. So uh, we, we've touched upon these a little bit. They're apocrine. Um, they're derived originally from apocrine sweat glands, although they are their own thing now. Um, and it produces a mother's milk, which I would love to spend a whole day talking about. It's, it's fascinating, um, but we don't have time for that. Um, the uh, embryologically, there's this embryological milk line uh, that exists, and from our history in the past when we needed more than uh, two nipples, and occasionally uh, people will have, you'll see a person with a supernumerary nipple. That's where that uh, derives from. It's from the uh, the embryological milk line. Um, okay, that's it. I was going to talk about cancer, but I don't, I don't have time. I killed it by screwing around with the computer, first thing. Um, are there questions? No? Okay. Um, thank you. I'll see you guys. Oh, wait. There will be a quiz on uh, the last three lectures uh, on Friday. Okay. So there'll be a quiz over this material next time that I see you. And midterm exam on March 17th, we decided, right?